As we prepare to hear God's word for us this morning, let us pray together. Gracious God, you are here when we gather in your name. Because you are here, help us hear you. And in hearing you, may we hear and obey the living word, even Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. We are continuing our sermon series on the parts of our worship service, why we do what we do when we do it. Uh, We're using uh, chapter 6 of Isaiah as our organizing text, because the form of our worship service follows the pattern of worship that is seen in that text. Last week, Calvin talked about the beginning of worship, especially the call to worship, in which we remind ourselves that we are indeed in the presence of the Holy God, who has invited us to be there. And everything we do in worship flows from that understanding. Today we're going to be looking especially at the prayer of confession. And so we're going to begin again today uh, with Isaiah's amazing vision of being in God's presence in the temple, from Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 8. Hear the word of the Lord. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. We now go from this extraordinary vision of Isaiah's in the temple to the day-to-day reality of the fisherman Peter. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, and I'm reading today from the message translation of Scripture. Once when Jesus was standing on the lake shore of Lake Gennesaret, the crowd was pushing in on him to better hear the word of God. He noticed two boats tied up. The fishermen had just left them and were out scrubbing their nets. He climbed into the boat that was Simon's and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Sitting there, using the boat for a pulpit, he taught the crowd. When he finished teaching, he said to Simon, Push out into the deep water and let your nets out for a catch. Simon said, Master, we've been fishing hard all night and we haven't caught even a minnow. But if you say so, I'll let out the nets. It was no sooner said than done. A huge haul of fish, straining the nets past capacity. They waved to their partners in the other boat to come help them. They filled both boats, nearly swamping them with the catch. Simon Peter, when he saw it, fell to his knees before Jesus. Master, leave I'm a sinner and can't handle this holiness. Leave me to myself. When they pulled in that catch of fish, awe overwhelmed Simon and everyone with him. It was the same with James and John, Zebedee's sons, co-workers with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, There is nothing to fear. From now on, you'll be fishing for men and women. They pulled their boats up on the beach, left them, nets and all, and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pulitzer Prize-winning author Annie Dillard, who happens to be a Presbyterian, 
in her essay, An Expedition to the Pole, talks about early North and South Polar expeditions and how, for the most part, they did not show an understanding of the geographic and climactic conditions that they would encounter. Many of them were completely unequipped to survive. I mean, they brought tea sets with them and chess boards and libraries, but not warm coats and boots. She compares the cluelessness of those early explorers to the ways that we often do worship. She says this, On the whole, I do not find Christians outside the catacombs sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea of what sort of power we so blithely invoke? Or, as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. For the sleeping God may wake and take offense. Or the waking God may draw us out to, to where we can never return again. Well, now, I don't know if Annie Dillard is right about our worship practices, that we, as she says elsewhere in the essay, are like cheerful, brainless tourists on a packaged tour of the absolute. That may be a bit extreme, but I'm not sure that we are as keenly aware as were Isaiah and Simon Peter, of what it means to be in the presence of the Holy One. Isaiah was at worship in the temple. Peter was in the midst of the familiar rhythm of everyday life. In those very different places, they found themselves in the presence of the Holy God. And each of them immediately saw himself in the light of God's holiness. Each of them was awestruck. Each of them knew himself to be unworthy to be in this presence. And each one asked, what am I doing here? And each one knew that he was being drawn out to where he could never return to where nothing would ever be the same again. When we gather for worship, we affirm that God is present with us. Perhaps in a way that is different from the ways that God is with us in the midst of all of our everyday realities. And perhaps what is different here is that we notice that God is with us. We pay attention to God. Here we take time to really listen to what God might have to say to us. The first thing we do when we gather for worship is again to remind ourselves that God is with us. We allow ourselves to be awestruck that the Holy One has invited us here. That we find ourselves in God's presence. And so, like the seraphim of, of Isaiah's vision, we give praise to God. Holy, holy, holy. Like Peter, we bow down in humble adoration. The prelude, the introit, the call to worship, the hymn of praise, all are meant to remind us that we are in the presence of the awesome and holy God. And then, right into, in our worship service, built right in there, is the what am I doing here 
moment. The woe is me, I am lost, for I'm a person of unclean lips moment. The go away from me, Lord, because I am a sinful person moment. And we call that the prayer of confession. It's our look at ourselves in the presence of the holy God. And it undoes us. It undoes all our illusions about ourselves. Now, we may be able to look at ourselves in comparison with our friends or our neighbors or our spouses or the other people sharing the pew with us this morning and think that we are pretty decent folks. And and we probably are pretty decent folks. But in the presence of the holy and righteous God, all such comparisons mean nothing. Here, we confess that we have not met the standards of the holy, loving, and gracious God. We have not been the people that God has called us to be. So with David, the ancient king of Israel, we confess and we come to understand, O God, against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Here we know we are not who we pretend to be. Finding ourselves in the presence of God elicits confession. And in that confession, we really do find ourselves. There is a story that's told about the great conductor Arturo Toscanini. He, one night, led a symphony in a masterful performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And when it was over, the audience just erupted in cheers and applause and more cheers and more applause and demanded encore after encore. And after many bows, Toscanini wrapped his baton on his music stand to get the orchestra's attention. What was going on? Was he angry with them? The orchestra didn't know. Finally, he whispered fiercely to them, I am nothing. And they just sat there, stunned. And he rapped again. And he said, You are nothing. And again, they just sat looking at him. Then with a tone of adoration, he said, Ah, but Beethoven, Beethoven is everything, everything. In confession, we acknowledge we are nothing. God is everything. Well, I can imagine about now, some of you are thinking, wow, that's a real downer. (laughs) Am I supposed to come to church and leave feeling bad about myself or even worse than I already do? Am I supposed to regard myself as nothing? Is that how God wants me to look at myself? And some of you may be thinking, Well, Toscanini may have felt that he and his musicians were nothing, but that Beethoven symphony would not have gotten played without them. What is so great about both the biblical stories for today and about our order of worship is that none of them stop with, woe is me, what am I doing here? Of course, again, we do see ourselves as we are in the presence of the holy God and we confess our unworthiness. But thankfully, for us as it was for Isaiah and for Peter, the stories and the worship order do not stop there. As were Isaiah and Peter, We are assured 
of forgiveness, invited to listen to God's word to us and to hear ourselves commissioned to do God's work in the world. In C.S. Lewis's children's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, four British children come into the magical land of Narnia via an old wardrobe. And they learn from Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, who are indeed beavers but who talk, that they will meet the great king Aslan. And they are very excited about this until they learn that Aslan is a lion. Oh, said Susan, I had thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. We need to know that God is not safe, but God is good. God is not our equal, our buddy, our boyfriend, our pet. God is the king whom, when we meet, we are filled with awe and with dread because of our sinfulness. But as the story continues, and as our worship order goes on, we encounter grace. A welcome in, an assurance that God is ever faithful and ever merciful, an invitation to hear what God has to say to us, and a call to service. Theologian John Oswalt writes, God does not reveal himself to destroy us, but rather to redeem us and to use us for his purposes in the world. What we learn when we gather for worship is that God is intent on receiving us just as we are and on using us with all our failures and with all our imperfections. Annie Dillard has a bit more to say about our worship. A high school stage play is more polished than this service that we have been rehearsing since the year one. In 2,000 years, we have not worked out all the kinks. We positively glorify them. Week after week, we witness the same miracle, that God is so mighty that he can stifle his own laughter. Week after week, we witness the same miracle, that God, for reasons unfathomable, refrains from blowing our dancing bear act to smithereens. Week after week, Christ washes the disciples' dirty feet, handling their very toes, and repeats, it is all right, believe it or not, to be people. Several years ago, when I was teaching a confirmation class, I asked the young people to write responses to some questions about worship on some big uh, newsprint graffiti sheets on the wall. One of the questions was something like, what do most of your friends think about worship? One young man wrote, that it's for losers with nothing better to do with their time. It's for losers with nothing better to do with their time. I surprised the class by saying, that is a great understanding of worship. We do come to worship God because we know we are losers and there really is nothing better that we could be doing with our time. 
In the act of confession, we acknowledge that we fail again and again. We acknowledge that we are losers who need the forgiving grace of God. In the act of confession, our dirty feet, our cruddy toes are washed clean. We are not left as we were. And those who have been cleansed by this kind of grace are sent out to a world that needs to be put right. Our gatherings here on Sunday are for the purpose of of worshiping the Lord God the rest of the week. It's here in church that we are reminded of who we are and who we represent in the day-to-day activities of our lives. Isaiah and Peter, full of awe and astonishment and a deep sense of unworthiness, were chosen and called and cleansed and commissioned. And so are we. And that is exactly what we are doing here. Amen.